Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 219 for Monday, July 15th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, as usual, in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How is your usual day going, my friend? My day is going great. We just got off a pretty good, I just did four, 10 gigs in 14 days. I, uh, 12 of them, no, eight of them were half rock, rocker gigs and two of them were some form of solo gigs. It was exhilarating, exhausting. The weather's been beautiful. I mean, incredible. Uh, so we didn't get one of those heat spells that are really debilitating. Right, right. You know, you get one of those gigs and can wreck you for a week, right? Totally. Yeah, because you, it, it, I mean, it, it's hot and exhausting, but it's also massively dehydrating. Not that gigs Absolutely. aren't dehydrating enough to begin with, but then, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 10 and, in, you know, 10 in 14, is that, that's what you said? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Man, that's, that's like, so my record, which, oh, well. I mean, the the record I always think about is my 14 gigs in 14 days in 14 different cities. While That's crazy. Man. Yeah, that that was. Um, but, you know, when you're on the road and you're not just your primary responsibility, your only responsibility is playing those gigs. It really didn't like it wasn't it's not it wasn't nearly as grueling as it sounds when I say it out loud. But of course, I was 20 years younger and, you know, all those yeah, things, too. No, absolutely. But but, it, you know, it was just like it's all in a day's work is really what it was. It was like, get up. Well, that, do it thing. sounds like a good idea when I'm booking stuff. But then you know, <laughs> when you go through it, the deal is, you know, like I know Simon was did several doubles during that time. Mm. So he probably did. He probably did 12 in 14 days. Right. right. He was with me on a couple of them. So, you know, I just worry about the health of my guys. And then, you know, Bill, who you know, gets there early, sets stuff up. He's in the high sun for a lot of this work. And he's just, he's just yeah. Iron Man. He's unbelievable. I mean, the dedication that guy has, I, I say it all over and I, I'm always very happy to say it on the show. Every band should be so lucky as we are to have a bill. I mean, he is unbelievable. I, I mean, he takes I, care of everything. Yeah, it's true. He's you great. Need, Our last gig like was that. a, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're lucky enough to get it, it's hard to get a guy who, has the ability, especially, you know, as you get into your, into your more mature years here, you know, a guy that has the time yes. doesn't have day job constraints. You know, we're just so fortunate. The last gig of the run was a festival gig. And I, I think I've shared with you, we don't do too many of those because the change over time from band to band is so painful. Right. Um, uh, luckily for us. So the changeover was going to be 30 minutes, which is almost impossible close without bill it is t totally impossible but um fortunately the band that played before us are some friends of ours great local band called the cocktail monkeys um and i gotta say they did some really cool stuff they did they did won't get fooled again almost note for note wow. i mean it was it was really fun that's awesome uh yeah so they they played a great set but they're our buddies and they know and they they took 10 minutes off of their set time to give to us for setup which is about as cool a professional thing as you know that situation could could ever hope for so have you yeah, ever our, worked i because i've i've dealt with you know similar scenarios or whatever and if you know the bands that are playing earlier you know especially in a in a scenario like you have where it's like a 10 piece um if there is you know let's say that, and i don't know how big the cocktail monkeys are but but in a you know just a sort of generic scenario where you've got a 10 piece band playing after a three piece band I've often found that you can set some of your 10 piece bands, you know, especially back line up while that three piece band is sort of, you know, getting their stuff in place and and help things along later on down the road. Uh, as long as everybody knows each other and is respectful and, you know, all those things, obviously. So, Well, we've shared backline a couple of times, like a couple of times guys have used drum sets, you know, yep. when, when we're a headliner and, you know, totally. and it was a band that we knew and we knew that the equipment would be respected. We've done that. Um, but, you know, in order to do that this time, that means someone would have to show up three hours before a gig. And, uh, you know, most of my guys are really happy to pretty much, <laughs> yeah. pretty much you get there, you know, call time, 
you know, is an hour and 15 before sound check is usually an hour before, but this time we only get a line check 30 minutes before. Yeah. I will tell you one good lesson I get from these festivals that I, I had to teach myself was the reminder to reach out and compare song lists, set lists with the other bands. Oh, in the definitely. Bill. Yes. Ugh. Oh, multi-band bill. Well, I mean, there's, there's two rules. One it is, you know, reach out ahead of time and do it. And number two is, if you're playing later in the day, know darn well with the bands before you played. Right. Because even if you didn't if you didn't get to compare, whoever plays first gets first dibs, right? Well, and, it's and really if you don't compare, but even if you do compare, the whole horse trading is a little bit of a negotiation skill, right? So, yeah. you know, I, I and you know, again, the band that played before us, the Cocktail Monkeys, uh, we 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 did this it was totally easy because we know each other, great communication. There were three songs overlapped. I saw that one of one of the songs that I really wanted to play was part of their was part of their finale. So I said, hey, you know, I clearly this is an important song for you. I'll, I'll back off of that. But, you know, if I do that, are you cool? I'd like to keep the other two. They were totally fine with it. I've had times where bands have been jerks about it. Just like, nope, your problem, not my problem. We're playing yeah, when we play. We're playing before you. We win. Which is horrible. Yeah, yeah which is really horrible. It is. It is. That's and true. actually, I will yeah. often... I will often play the song anyway and say, you know, I know you heard this earlier, but check out our version of it. I mean, I will definitely, you know, deal with that in different ways. Hendrix so. did. Um, he had there's a, a the, the his live at Winterland album where they cover Sunshine of Your Love. And he says something. He's like, oh, you know, one of our favorite bands is the cream. And I'm just paraphrasing here. But, you know, he's like. I don't want to say we do this better than them or anything. <laughs> he's like, but we do it our way. You know, but like, it's definitely, he's saying our version is much better than theirs. You know, like that's, there's no there question go. that this is what Jimmy is communicating to you, you know, but, but again, that'll only come out of me if the band is non-cooperative and doesn't want to, you know, trade and basically, and they, there have been a couple that have done that, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. I will tell you one good leadership lesson that I got. Um, well, yeah, we have we have three things stacked up for this show that all sort of fit into this, you know, respect thing. Right. It, you know, respect. it's respecting other musicians, respecting other bands. So clearly now we have four things because we just finished one topic. But but yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we one of the shows in the run, um, one of the guys in the band wasn't quite there on the one to start a couple of songs in the first six songs of the set of the yes. show. Yeah. And, you know, I noticed it and I turned around and I said, come on, man, get your head in the game or something to that effect. Right. Right. And the goal was to just demonstrate as the leader, I hear that you haven't been there. If you're you know, if you've got your mind on other things, I'm trying to pull you in and say, come on, man, focus. Right. Yep. It came off a little harsh, harsher than I intended. And when that happens in my mind, I'm always thinking I should have enough goodwill built up that the guys would know I would never try to embarrass anybody on the stage. Right. But for whatever reason, you know, the frustration of missing a couple, the tone I might've had, uh, you know, maybe, a, a, you know, a certain intensity in my voice, it got interpreted, you know, wrong. Yeah. And, uh, we had or a good, maybe it got interpreted, right. <laughs> Just well, saying. no, no, I never would want to embarrass anybody. Oh, and that's, yeah, no. you know, right, right. But once the team is on the field, it's all about constructive stuff. So what but, my but I'm saying they, was it, they might have heard the accurate level of frustration instead of the level that you wished to convey. Uh, maybe. May, may, I'm, yeah, I wasn't there. So I'm just saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, again, I would say my mind, I know where my mind usually is on stage and it's as a leader and a coach and trying to keep the team, you know, on the same page and stuff. So the goal is, all right, man, bear down, you know, come on, let's, let's get it back together. We're all in this together. Right. Yep. But it came off as stop screwing up, you know, yep. Or, yep. Was, yep. was not, not, not the intent. It was more like, I, I want your focus for the rest of the show. So let's, let's get it on. But it came out wrong. But the yep. nice thing was, is that the individual who I had this with is a very, very good communicator. And they just let me know. I'm just, I, that tone just doesn't work for me. Oh, and I was like, fair. you know what? Yep. And I said, that's exactly what I said. I said, that's absolutely fair. I said, I want you to understand my intent and I want you to understand where I was coming from. I want you to know that I would never, you know, cause I'm even in the moment, I know if you embarrass a guy, you're not going to whip him into shape for the rest of the gig. He's going to be, 
you know, he's going to be off for the rest of the gig. So I would always take any more in-depth dive on something after a Afterwards, show. Afterwards, sure. Yeah, that's, but that's in this case, goal. it got... Yeah, for sure. It, you know, whatever it was, hot day, you know, whatever, it got interpreted wrong. It it was, as a leader, A, if, if it wasn't a great communicator, I would want to be really in tuned to the body language after I've said something to see what the reaction is of my bandmate, right? Yep. If they shrink down, drop their shoulders and look defeated, I've done something wrong as a leader. If, if they look at me and say, I got it, you know, I'm with you, you know, then I'll know that we, we connected. This was somewhere in between, right? Yep. But again, we had a good conversation afterwards. I, I apologize if the person felt embarrassed, you know, or singled out in a way amongst his band. And, and again, I'm turning my back to the audience when this is happening. So right, that, right. it's not on mic or anything like that. But um, but it was a good lesson for me that, you know, be be cautious in your understand the purpose of when you're communicating to get someone's attention in your band. And there's a whole range of tactics to do that. Again, the, the stage is sacred, right? Once you're on there, you, you're, everything is about getting the best performance out of out of your musicians out of yourself and so you know your focus on that is what's most important so and my lesson this- my leadership lesson is don't rely on what you think is the good karma you may have built up you, you're still accountable for the tone that you talk to your bandmates with absolutely yes absolutely my question it is how it would an attentive audience member have been aware that this person was not like there for for a, a few tunes um probably not but okay. what happens i think especially in a 10-piece band where you got a lot of personalities on you are at least i'm keenly aware and i think everybody else is keenly aware the thought kind of goes through people okay is it going to be one of those days right you know sure. <laughs> especially if it's early in the set right so, no, so I, that's the, why the reason i ask this is um i i remember and I, I come back to Bowling for Soup many, many times uh, in, in the past, and I'm sure I will in the future, and I'll do it right now, because those guys really are masters of – they've mastered the art of performing live. They, I mean, they really – they're also great songwriters. Like, if you want, like, sophomoric power pop, nothing gets better than that. The harmonies, like, <laughs> the tight tunes. It's – like, it's great. It, like, take the sophomoric part out. They know how to write power pop tunes. They also know how to write really sophomoric, like, cheeky lyrics, and and they're masters at that, too. But I've, I've seen them live enough. They used to play at South by Southwest all the time, which is where I started seeing them, and then I, you know, and then I got to like them, and so I would, you know, kind of go out of my way a little bit to, to see them as well. But there was one show. They stop and start in the middle of songs. Like, they... I always used to think Arlo Guthrie was the master of telling stories in the middle of songs. He is, and so is Jarrett Reddick. Um, like he really has a, a knack for it and he'll stop in the middle of a tune and tell some story and then just like kick the band right back in. And so he was in the middle of his story and then, and it, they were in their, their, well, their cover of SR 71's 1985, which most people think is a Bowling for Soup song, but it's actually not, even though the folks in SR 71 say it should be, um, <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds just like him, which is why I think the guy who wrote it in SR 71 called up Jarrett and was like, I think I have a song for you. But anyway, uh, they're in the middle of this and there's a spot where they they say and everything stops and they stop and they tell a story. And then it goes into the chorus and all Jarrett does to bring it in the chorus is says, you know, it was Bruce Springsteen and boom, like that's the downbeat and and they're off and the drummer missed it. And so this is now obvious to everyone in the audience, right? Like the, there's the band starts playing like three guys on stage are playing and singing and there ain't no drums, you know. And so Jarrett stops And without showing an inkling of frustration on his face, which is really like the key here. That's pro. Yes. He says, Gary, come with us. It's much more fun this way. (laughs) And, and does it again. And it was like, Oh my God. Like, like watching it. I, it took me, I had to double take myself on it. Like, wow, that was brilliant. Because if I was, if I hadn't been like, I think a couple of weeks before that, somebody had messed up on stage at a fling gig or whatever. And I had like berated him in absolutely the wrong way. Like I knew it was the wrong way while I was doing it. And I definitely knew it was the wrong way after the fact. So it was sort of on in my head and watching Jared do that. It was like, Oh my gosh, like how easy would it have been for me to just be like that guy? You know? So it really Mm. stuck with me just because of the timing of it. But that like that, there's a thing you can make 
if you do it and deliver it the right way, you can make that stuff totally part of your show. Uh, we, you know, when things, and now if, and that's why I asked, did the crowd know if the crowd didn't know, then it, maybe you don't even have to make it part of your show. But if the crowd's aware that somebody, you know, totally effed something up that, you know, m having a laugh about it in a way that's like totally productive. And I mean, the way he said it, all he said was, Hey Gary, come with us. It's more fun. But that like communicated we're a team we're all together everybody's having fun we want you with us like there was no you screwed up it was come with us you know so it was like the most friendly way and it was i mean it just a master class in in how to how to deal with something like that in the moment and you know the drummer smiled and and off they went and it was the rest of the song was fine it was you know and there's no sense that all right, he was being cute on stage here, but I'm going to hear about this after the gig. I, I, you could not see that in anyone's face. No. Uh -huh. And I will say this was, I think it was the same gig where I saw uh, Jarrett and, and Eric, and I can't remember his last name, their former bass player, but the original bass player in the band who's no longer with the band. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they had a, a really good like onstage banter. Eric bass player would play sort of the straight man and, and Jarrett always had like the jokes to deliver. And for whatever reason on this particular night, Eric was giving Jarrett a little more resistance than, uh, than Jarrett wanted and, and that I've ever seen him give before or since. And Jarrett started getting a little annoyed. So like there was like, I saw what him annoyed looked like. And of course he made that part of the show too. He told the sound man, look, turn off Eric's mic. I want to hear his harmonies. That's great. But when we're talking, there's no talking from him. And so the sound guy complied and it made it funny, but the, the, the catalyst to it was definitely not from a funny place. You know, it was, it, there was definitely frustration there, but watching it was, you know, like watching two friends actually have an argument. Uh, it, you know, it was, there was enough entertainment value there that it didn't seem weird, but it, there definitely, it was definitely, you know, I am frustrated with you. Mm. Um, I, this, this, we're changing this dynamic right now. And, and there was none of that with the drummer that in that particular moment. So. Well, that's cool. I mean, there is that there is that thing. There's the value of the rawness of your band. If that's the vibe of your band, mm -hmm. the realness of your band. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Southside Johnny and he wears his emotions on his sleeve. I think if someone in the audience or if someone in the in the crowd, not, not that he's not that he's aggressive, but I mean, he says what he thinks. And yeah. but that's what his fans like and want from him. If your band is purely, you know, about image and, and uh, you know, th and that's what your reality is, like a lot of sh quote unquote show bands are, you know, yes. you're not here for you're not here for our opinion. You're here for, you know, uh, you know, for the show, yeah, for the show. And then so that's it. Um, then that's who you are. And, you know, you don't do that type of thing. Right. But, you know, a lot of. Right. It depends yeah, on the you vibe. Need to, of the it, and, it, and it depends on the vibe of the front man. Right. Like that yes. person. It, if you do something, even if it worked for Jarrett Reddick or for Southside Johnny, if it doesn't work for you and doesn't fit into your vibe, jumping out of your vibe to do something that you saw someone else that do, yeah. it's going to seem really weird. Yeah, exactly. poison. That's actually poison. It, it, yeah. it shows a certain amount of disingenuity because then your audience is like, well, who are you? I thought you were I thought you were the happy guy. Yeah. Right. What is this about? And it's not like if in your mind you're like, well, listen. I'm going to show a side of myself to my audience and they're going to be really impressed with it. I think more, it's going to confuse them. It's going to be very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. You need to, you need to be this consistent person to them that they've got a relationship with, you know, uh, from that standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey, all right. So on this same respect, uh, path that we have going here, there's a conversation I've been wanting to have for a couple of weeks and it's about substance issues substances in general alcohol drugs you know whatever you want to call it it is definitely something that exists in our world of musicians right and and in music in general not only on stage but but you know in the crowd too right the like most of the gigs we play are at places that sell alcohol and people mm -hmm. are 
you know, taking alcohol and uh, pr- perhaps other things too, right? You know, like uh, weed's legal in many, many places. So there's like, even if it's not legal, it's, you know, decriminalized in even more places and people don't really seem to care. And so you've got that. But then you've got everything else that goes on too. Um, I've certainly played in bands where... Uh, no one has used anything during gigs. I've also played in game bands where I've been on stage with people who were, you know, straight up addicts and, uh, you know, having problems. And mm-hmm. and so, I, you know, there's there's a um, I, the, from to fit kind of into our, our respect episode here. It's the how do you uh, deal with that when when someone else in the band is is you know, having a problem with, with substances that's that, that you feel you need to bring up. And also how do you deal with it for yourself? You know, do you choose to use like alcohol or other drugs while you're performing? And at what level will you let yourself use those, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, I will, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the, the right way to sort of dive into this. But um, my my philosophy when dealing with other musicians and dealing with, you know, myself in terms of, uh, you know, how I will act around other musicians is I don't really care. I mean, on a personal level, I might care. But from a from the band and from a performance level, I don't care what you take before we go on stage or while we're on stage, as long as the performance is not impacted by it. So if somebody likes to have a beer, somebody likes to smoke joint before the show and it works for you, fine. How many chances do you give someone? Um, everybody gets one, it, you know, the, the, because it, there's times where you might overdo it. Um, it, you know, so I, I'm, I'm usually pretty, the, the, the first time it happens where somebody, you know, has too much to drink or whatever. And it's like, OK, well, that was kind of a mess. Like we might talk about it and joke about it at the next rehearsal or whatever. And that's fine. Um, and, and really no hard feelings like it happens. Uh, I've certainly been there. But after one time, then like that, that's usually it. Like you, you got to then it's then it's a more serious conversation like, hey, well, it's okay. a little bit more nuanced than that, because what does it mean? Does that mean forgetting the words to one song or incapacitated and sloppy the whole gig? I mean, what is what is your definition of it that crosses your line? Yeah, it's a good that's a good question. Um, it, and it depends on the person. Right. And it also depends on how much the band relies on that person. I had um, years ago, there was uh, an issue in in uh, in one of the bands where we had one guy that had had too much to drink. We had too much time before the gig. And, uh, and when we went on stage, he had, you know, if he normally goes on stage after one beer, uh, you know, this was after four or something. And, um, he couldn't remember the words to songs and was screwing things up. And like on the fly, we had to change the set list. So it's, you know, does it impact the band enough that we need to, you change know, r- yes do we need to route around this problem thinking of it from a, from a technical standpoint and if we have to route around it as a problem then we're gonna have a conversation after the gig you know if it's just like oh he's like happy and loose and 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 in control um, generally that that's not it but for me yeah it is when i have to think about your current state in order to make it through the show successfully that now we have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, like few things are black and white, although right. sometimes it's smart to make it black and white. Actually a substance policy is something I've seen bands adapt. Um, you know, what happens is, is a band starts to play, starts to get closer as friends, you develop some relationship and you know, yep. that, that which you were ignoring in the interest of getting your brand, your band, you know, off the ground. Um, now you're in a place where you can start to succeed. And that thing is a little bit more important to you, but now it's a friend. And, and if the friend has a problem, then you have, you know, mixed feelings about whether you want to just ax them, whether you want to help them. I mean, these things are, are as nuanced or as not nuanced as you want to make them. I now, you know, my band's been together 20 years. Right. I, I ignored some things in the beginning um, in the interest of, of moving forward. But now, 20 years later, you know, there are guys in my band where my band's 
revenue is part of their income. And I actually take that very, very seriously. You know, right. I'm accountable yeah, sure. now as a band leader, yeah. if, you know, for some guy's income. And, but everybody in the band is a very close friend of mine and I care about, and it's complicated for me. Yep. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's just, so you have those two tensions, you know, the, the tension of this is a business, right? It, it's a fun business and it's a creative business, but we're charging money. We're taking money. We're paying money. Yes. You know, right. this is a business. This is a creative endeavor where it's a bunch of people who I creatively connect and the sum of the parts is greater than, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for it, sure. The, so, it, you know, the, the, there it says knowing what I know now, though, I would probably as a grown up have a policy, you know, in the same way. In the same way that when I audition someone, I let them know exactly what they can expect and what exactly what I expect. Here's how much we'll rehearse. Here's, you know, if you're late, if, you know, if you don't want to learn your songs, I would be much more verbose about everything, probably including that stuff. Yeah. It's, so um, when, I was, when I was on the road with the clam bake, th- it was it was made uh, very clear just in the way you're saying, like, here's our policies. Here's how here's what to expect, all that stuff. It was made very clear that there was a no alcohol uh, during the gig policy and it was it, it, but it was just alcohol. Like if people wanted to, you know, if you liked to play and could play well, you know, after say, you, you know, smoking weed or w- like whatever, that was fine. What he it was a high and he explained it. He's like, we are a high energy band. Everything is, you know, on top of the beat. We really drive all night long and alcohol, you know, puts you, you know, kind of tilts the meter back a little bit. He's like, I've tried it. It doesn't work. So we just don't do it. And it was like, okay, that's fine. Now, anybody ever break the policy? They are banjo players. It was. Yeah. I mean, our banjo players first night with the with the band, uh, a guy named Billy Constable, uh, who has since passed away and. Uh, it's a real shame. I mean, it's a shame that he passed away and it's a shame that no one else gets to hear Billy play because he was truly one of those Special. people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but um, but Billy's first night with the band was not the first night of the tour. He joined us later in the tour. And uh, I mean, it was only a few nights in, but he had a he brought a beer up on stage and I saw it and I was like, OK, this will be interesting. Like, should I say something to him? No, I'm just a hired gun just like him. Like, doesn't matter. Like, I could have said something like, hey, just FYI, Maury told us, like, if he told you something different, that's fine. Whatever. You know, like, just just so you know, there's a thing. But I didn't. And uh, and after the gig, Maury, the band leader, very diplomatically just said something to him like, oh, hey, Billy, I forgot to tell you the policy, y- you know, and uh, and that's on me. But just so you know, we just don't have beer on stage. And and Billy was like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And uh, and he didn't care. So it it like and, and again, Maury handled it really, really well in in that particular scenario. Mm-hmm. So um, so, yeah, so that worked out fine. Now, I mean, you know, for um, but we we had two guys on stage that were recovering heroin addicts, so they didn't take anything ever uh, during the whole tour because, you know, they're they were in recovery. So uh, so that made that a little bit easier. It actually made the whole we had. We did have one guy in the band who was, uh, you know, like wake and bake high all the time. And I think I mentioned it on the show once that, that the day that he ran out of weed, it was the band's mission to find him weed because it like it was it it controlled his personality in a in a way that we all found very productive. So um, so but th- and that was fine. He would you know, uh, he he was I mean, like, everybody in that band i was i felt like i was the weakest player in that band everybody could play yeah so and he played fine it didn't matter whether he was to high or not like that that part was fine and he and he kept it under control like he was never you know passed out or anything he was just like but that's what i'm saying this is why that line is so weird it is right you're in the band and you're like well he can do it you know, so why not me? And the reason well, is why hate, not you? Because you, you don't handle it. High. Right. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but it's the thing, some other guy, and, and yeah. I, I find this like, you know, we don't have any substance abuse issues in, sure. in our band, uh, but different guys who have different tolerances to, to beer, to alcohol, yep. I, I think we have. Of course. And, yeah. But the problem is you uniformly do it. And, you know, the guy who can 
handle his his stuff? Does, does he get punished? I don't know. Do you? I, so you have a you have a no beer on stage and a no, but you can you can play same thing. The clam bake was like if you do something beforehand, as long as you're functioning at the level we want. There's no conversation to be had. There's no conversation to be had. That's correct. Have you yeah. ever had to have a conversation? You as a you as a you know a band leader yeah. or a band elder or something like that. Yeah, we it, there was a there there was an issue in Fling that, like I mentioned where somebody wasn't you know was, we had to sort of route around that and it happened twice like it twice in you know six weeks or something the mm. first time it was like whatever and and I did I made sort of a joke about it at the next re- rehearsal or whatever just to. Just to get it, keep it out in the open. I am, it, if, you, if you've been listening to this podcast long enough, you probably already know this about me, but I am not somebody that finds value in stuffing it down, right? Like <laughs> it is way better to just say it and and then it's not a big deal. You know, it's not as big of a deal as it would be if, you know, you, you hold on to it and wait four years and then now you've got 15 times to draw upon. Like that stuff doesn't, it, it, for me, doesn't work. So I just <laughs> said it and it was just like, oh yeah, 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 you know, we had to uh, alter the set list because so and so, and it was like, yeah, 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 whatever, you know. And we sort of laughed about it, but it was out in the open that we had to alter the set list because of this scenario. And there are many scenarios where we have to alter the set list. Like this is okay, it happens lots, you know. But here was one that could have been controlled, just like anything could be controlled. You know, if the keyboard craps out, well, okay, we'll alter the set list, but let's figure out. And make sure that the keyboard doesn't crap out at the next gig, for example. Right. So now we have somebody that had too much to drink and we had to route around that. And so it's like, OK, let's figure out how to not have that happen. And the what the way to not have that happen, of course, is don't drink so much. Like, think about your, you know, your limits before you hit the stage. And it did. It happened like six weeks later or whatever. And so we had to have a little more of a like heart to heart. You know, Fling is a locked in band. Like nobody's going to get you'd have to do a lot to get thrown out of Fling. We're all like you say with the house rockers. Yeah, we're all really good friends, you know. So um, so it was more like, okay, let's have this conversation. Uh, You know, the gigs are places where, you know, yes, it's fun. But like you said, we're all here to to put on a product and. We care about that collectively, in individually and collectively, right? And so I think it, be okay I think all musicians. It. Well, I, I'll, I'll challenge you on this one. I'll push back a little bit. Sure. I think all musicians care about the product, but their perception about the delivery of the product. My optic, yeah. Again, go back to what I was saying before. You know, like I want my band to be able to get paid because I know there are guys who depend on getting paid. Absolutely. I didn't start the band for that, right? So when I started the band. I had a day job, you know, I I wanted to be good and I wanted to see if I could express myself, but I didn't do it as a financial thing. But as time went on and, you know, fully half of my band, more than half of my band makes their living from music. They teach, they coach, they do something, uh, they record, whatever they do, but music is their income and the house rockers are a significant part of that. My entire optic is what's going to be good for the band to continue to do that and continue to move up the ladder in terms of pay scale and quantity of gigs. Sure. I am always thinking, what if someone from company X is in the audience? What do they see when they see? So I'm always like dress is important. Stage demeanor is important. You know, these things, these things are really important. I don't think anybody, in fact, I'm sure there's not a single soul in my band. And I would say most people take the stage you know, if you're going to put yourself out there, you are concerned about the quality of your playing. It just seems like not everybody always has the same sense of what the whole picture aesthetic. looks like. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And oh, it's, no, not, I, it's not an evil thing. It's not it's not a destructive on purpose thing. It's a blind spot. Sometimes so, it's a destructive on purpose thing. I, uh, I, I, will, I will challenge you with that. Like there's some some people like especially with dress on stage. I find this more than anything else. And it. Like, I, 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 I truly don't understand it. Like, I have my principles, uh, you know, and I certainly understand, you know, cutting off my nose to spite my face, right? Like, I've done that more times than I care to count. But, the, like, dress on stage, just think about, like, what does it look like when somebody walks in and sees your band up on stage? Does it look like four guys or six guys or five guys, 10 guys, doesn't matter, right? Does it look like four people that just literally finished mowing their lawns and grabbed a guitar and decided to sing some songs and play some songs and wow, that guy can shred, but like clearly it, like 
dress is the easiest one. I, I, I again, I just don't understand when someone chooses. No, like you can explain this to people, and I have, and said, look, you know, if we don't look good, we don't look good. And there's something in them that says, yeah, but I'm going to wear my ratty T-shirt and, you know, and it's my thing. It's like, but why is it your thing? Like, why is that a truth? Right. Like, like, let's let's examine. I get that you believe it's your thing. Cool. Explain to me why. Like, get to that part of it, because I can tell you why I wear what I wear on stage. You need to tell me why you wear what you wear. And maybe it's okay. Like you don't understand. I, and and like I'm about to say something that I am fully guilty of, you know, but maybe <laughs> it's something like that person doesn't understand fashion. I don't understand fashion all that well either. Like, but so you need some coaching in that regard, right? Like, OK, get it. you like the, the T-shirt and jeans look great. That's great. OK, so that's your thing. And maybe it's your thing because you like Bruce Springsteen or or you like, you know, somebody else that dresses like that. I think Bruce wears T-shirt and jeans, right? Um, no more. OK, well, see, there you go. But whatever, like maybe your idol is, you know, where's the T-shirt and jeans? And OK, you want to do that. But let's accessorize a little bit. Like, let's make it look like this is an intentional look, not an I just finished mowing the lawn look. So yeah. maybe there's a necklace to go along with it or a special belt buckle or I don't know, you know, like a hat or a thumb, a something or wear guy liner if that's your thing. Like something that that shows I put care into the way I look for you as an audience. And more important than all of that distinguishes you from the people in the audience so that it looks like you're supposed to be up there. Well, I agree a thousand percent, but I'd also add to that, you know, dress is the easy one, but having, you know, half a dozen half empty, full empty beer cups around your station where you're playing, I think is the same thing as, you know, is it, is it a mess? And are you a mess? And, and uh, it's, it's a thing, man. And again, it's not a thing if you don't care. And not, it, it's not a thing if you don't care what type of gigs you get. Right. And, right. you know, if your band collectively is saying, we're just going to be who we are. And if someone wants to hire us for that, that's fine. But if you're more consciously driving to something, you know, that's fine. And again, it's, uh, you, you got to be honest about who you pick for your bandmates. You might love a guy, but, do you, you know, would you live with him? Because that's oh, really what you're doing. Yeah. You're living with him. Oh, it, and then go on the road with them, man. Then you're actually <laughs> living with them. <laughs> living with them. You're driving with them. You're oh, sleeping with them. Man, yeah. It's a whole different ball of wax right there. Yep. <laughs> but that's one of the cores. We've said this so many times over the years. One of the cores of success is do the band have shared values? Yeah. Right. And this is shared values about music, shared values about performance, shared value about look. I would say the most successful bands. I think I told you this story that there's a, there's a, one of the first tribute bands in this area is a, is a band called super diamond, which now tours the world, putting on this Neil diamond tribute show. Oh, they were, okay. yeah. they were the, one of the first tribute acts that I've ever seen. They're from the Bay area. And um, when I was getting started with the band, I wanted to get some advice about how to be successful. And so I called and I talked to uh, someone who was ostensibly their manager. And that was the first bit of advice I get. He said, you know, everybody thinks they're great. But everybody's perception, what it takes to be great is is wildly different. Find That's guys really, who share the same vision. That's really interesting. Yeah. Everybody thinks they're great and wants to be great. But the definition of great is the <laughs> thing that matters most. Yeah. 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 That's what this whole episode's about is that definition of great. Right. I think so. Is, I mean, and it's and and, sharing and the it. answer is respect. Like respecting your audience, respecting your fellow bandmates, be, you know, which takes some self-awareness. Like, right. I mean, it's this whole, like you said earlier, zoom out a little bit. Are you seeing the big picture? If you're not either like take some time and see the big picture or defer to the person that is like that. That's yeah, that's a good one. Defer to the person it is. Are, do you have the ability, which is hard. Self-awareness is hard. Yeah. Do you have the ability to check yourself? Right. You know, if there's some tension because of something that's not a shared value. Right. 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 Are you digging your heels in because I'm me and I'm a great player? Or are you like, hey, we're trying to get somewhere together. And, uh, you know, I better I better examine this. And am I am I on the bus or am I on the bus so long as you let me be me (laughs) or am I I off the bus? Well, and, you know, that's I I think this is where 
um, my theater involvement, especially in, you know, the, my my recent theater involvement. So the last five years or so has really opened my eyes to the concept of having a director. Right. Like because because what you just described is you know, the, a scenario where you would have a director that that has that vision and by definition they are the ones that are dictating what that vision is. Now, a good director won't just come in and say, you know, I'm laying down the law. You must look like this. They'll be like, OK, let's engage a little bit. Here's the character here. I mean, if it's an original piece of work versus a you know previously written piece of work, well, there's you know, there's obviously you might come with some some things that just have to be. But but still, it's like, OK, who are you as an artist and how can I fit what you are as an artist into what I need as, for the overall vision of this thing, because you as an artist aren't seeing the overall vision of this thing. That's my job, right? So now we need to collaborate and figure out how to take what you bring and make it seem like a part of this cohesive whole. And, and so you really like, there's a value in having someone in your band acting as that director. And if you don't, then you probably won't present yourselves as a cohesive band. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. When you auditioned for Uptown. Yeah. Was there any kind of uh, interview process or just, hey, let's chat for a while where they were trying to feel out their vibe with you as a, you know, in terms of your values? And, you know, did they ever ask you, did they say to you, here's what we were on stage? Are you cool with that? Yes. It, right. We had that. That conversation was here's what we were on stage. Um, I did. I had two. I think maybe just two. There were several emails back and forth, but in terms of phone convers and the emails covered a lot of this too. But you know, I had a, a phone conversation or two with Gary, who's the leader of the band and guitar player and the guy who you know sort of wrangles everything together. He, he's the leader, and uh, and it was yeah. Look, here's what we wear on stage. It's like that's fine, you know. And uh, but as we were doing this, I'm trying to like listen for the things he's not telling me explicitly. Mm. Like, like. How, how, who are you as people? Like, what's your demographic, right? Am I going to fit in with that? And if I want to fit in with that, how can I alter? Not, I'm not going to lie to you, but how can I present the right parts of myself so that it looks to you like I fit into that demographic? I mean, if they told me they're like, oh yeah, we're all metalheads and we're, we're massively into, uh, and I don't, I don't mean to say that all metalheads are into heroin, but let's say that they said, oh yeah, we're, we're metalheads and, uh, we're all into heroin and we like to go, you know, beat animals after, after work or something like, I don't share any of those qualities. So I'm not sure that I have any of those to, to like highlight, to make them feel comfortable with me. But, mm. you know, as they, as they did share the things or as Gary did sort of share, I was sort of building a picture in my head of, okay, here's who these people are. Here's how they are. They're all professionals. They all have, you know, real jobs or run their own businesses. They're all, you know, very much financially, uh, it, it, I don't want to say independent, but but they're capable of taking care of themselves, right? You know, like great, okay. Nobody's doing this particular band for the money, although there's plenty of money and the people like the money. Great, okay. So I can I can tell them that I am in that same boat, which it turned out I was, right? Like finding those clues and then making sure in conversation I dropped little hints here and there that like I'm like you in that regard. I'm like you in this regard. In the ways that I wasn't like them, I just didn't have to highlight that. Like that can come up later when we're hanging out backstage and you realize that I'm actually kind of a weirdo. Like that's okay. Y you know, but let, like, let's, let me make you comfortable with who I am and you mm. and vice versa. So it was like going to that first audition, which was the first time I met any of them in person was like, okay, how do I dress for this? Do I show up in a t-shirt and shorts? No, these guys are professional. Like I'm going to show up in jeans and a, you know, button down black shirt. Like, like I would wear to a, a gig if I wasn't told to wear something else, you know, I'm not going to show up looking like I'm, you know, in makeup and, and dressed for like Hedwig, like I'm going to be this weekend with a wig on or anything, you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, like show up like gig ready. Like I'm here to perform. I'm not just here to hang out, you know, and, um, and I, it worked, right. I got the gig. So, uh, I mean, I also showed up and played, but you'll notice that in no part of those, the, the whole story I just told was playing part of it. That was a given. Of course Look, I can play, right? Here's the deal. Yeah. That, that, it is a given, but the deal is also this. 
a lot of people can play. That's the thing. Of course. Right. Yeah. I'm, I cannot compete on that level. I mean, I can, but that's not where I'm actually going to win or lose the gig is everybody that shows up is going to be able to play these songs well enough to go and do these, all these gigs with this band. Like I, that, no, no question. So what can I bring to the table that makes you feel more comfortable with me? Yeah. 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 I, I, again, th- this concept of musical purity, you have to be able to play, but everybody should be able to play. I mean, you kind of will weed out those who can't real fast. It's all, yeah. It's all, especially in the cover band scene, sounds like in the, in the, um, in the theater band scene, it's all those intangibles about how much you get professionalism, how much you get teamwork, how much you get communication. It's all those other, you know, shades of gray things for which there is a wide range of perception of what's, what's, acceptable and not acceptable. And those are the places where, you know, connections are made. Again, a guy who, a guy whose perception is dirty t-shirt and and jeans is acceptable. There's a tribe for him out there somewhere. There's a band where everybody's like that and they're happy, totally happy. And they're probably playing great music. You know, where they can get booked is, you know, maybe a, a function of that in the cover band scene, you know, and I'm not talking about the original thing. If, if your vibe is an original group, you know, is, is, you know, kind of dressed downy. Cause that's the vibe of how we interpret our music. Go, you know, via con Dios, Good right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I you know, whatever. That's a good idea, but fine. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, you better be as good as fish if you're going to do that. Right. Right. Well, and, 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 but here's the thing. Yes. Fish sort of goes on stage with, you know, no care about their dress. Actually, that's not true at all. Those guys all, <laughs> Like, well, their drummer since day one has worn a dress on stage with with like donuts on it. So he definitely has a costume. <laughs> their bass player has always like like, you know, cared about his outfit. And then he really got into doing that so much so that they put him on the cover of GQ. Right. So Trey Anastasio is really the only one in that band that if you want to say he goes on stage looking like, you know, some dude that just finished mowing his lawn, like he would be the closest to that. But even still, like he cares about what sneakers he's wearing on stage. He's like, there's definitely intention. His brand is is foremost. Right. But that's just it is he built, he knows what he wants that to look like. And so he's intentional about how that happens. But along with that, fish is intentional about everything that they do. Like all the things that they tell you, Oh yeah, there's no set list. BS. There's of course there is. Right. But but they've got this mystique about them. And oh, yeah, well, you haven't played that song in a long time. And wow, we just busted it out. Yeah, but we rehearsed it yesterday in private. Like like there's always like, like, like those guys think more about it than most bands I know of. They just they just exude a vibe of, hey, whatever happens, happens. It's cool. Like, yeah, that's a great product. Yeah, man. Like they know what they're doing. So well, it's like when you watch that the documentary on the Eagles and, and you know, the peaceful, easy feeling on the outside. Right. But they are, you know, Glenn yeah. and Don were driving the bus for a for a result. These these things don't happen by accident. So, you know, if you have songs as good as the Eagles, Maybe you can be, you know, jeans yeah. and denim shirts and, and get through. If you don't, or if you're a cover band who wants to, you know, go up the ladder of, of pay scale type gigs, you should have some purpose to what you're doing. But even if you do write songs as good as the Eagles, let's pretend that somebody out there, I hope one of you is this. And please, if you've got these songs, <laughs> send them to us. I'd love to hear them. But, right? You know, but let's say that one of you can write songs as good as the Eagles. Why in the world would you want to sell yourself short by going on stage in a ratty t-shirt and ripped up jeans without like, why would you go on stage without any care as to your appearance? I think that's a better way to say it, right? Like, why would you not want to present yourself so that people will like give you the time of day and actually listen to your songs? Like, so would you just say it again for the thousandth time? Live music is a visual art. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It is. It's a visual art. Of course it is. Otherwise, you just it's otherwise it's recorded music that you're listening back to <laughs> right? or you're in the dark. Like that would be, actually be a kind of a cool. I mean, there'd be all kinds of safety concerns and everything. <laughs> but wouldn't that be like if you could somehow like keep people from being bad people? Uh, 
wouldn't it be a cool thing to like put everybody in a room, sit them down and say, okay, look for the next 20 minutes. You can't get up. Everybody agrees. Great. Now you turn off the lights and the band plays in the dark. You're just going to listen to the music. No visual element. Like we're going to. Room- sounds like a fish Halloween deal. It it sounds like, like that actually sounds like a really fun thing to do. We've got a, <laughs> we've got a, um, a gig coming up with fling that we just booked it on November 30th. So it's the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we're doing it at this place. We've done a couple of shows called Sue's Space, which is a private, just it, it's a, a, essentially a hall. Like there's no bar there. There's no, it's a BYO, whatever you want. You know, you bring your own mm-hmm. food, bring your own beer. And if you happen to bring a bunch of weed and smoked it outside, I don't think anybody would care, but I can't, I certainly can't tell you that that's okay. Cause it, we live in the state <laughs> of New Hampshire where that's not okay. But uh, my guess is that based on what I've seen at other shows, I'm pretty sure nobody would care. Um, but wouldn't that be interesting to like sit everybody down and turn off the lights and play a set of music? Got kind of you are, I think. I'm kind of into this. I mm. might do it because we're doing the gig with this band called the Church Ladies, who ha- definitely have like this this vibe. Their singer dresses up in a nun's habit. He's a guy. Uh, there are women in the band. Like they have a whole shtick and they do their thing and they have a real visual element to it. So I wonder if Fling should go in the complete opposite direction for this huh. funny it would be interesting right like there you go i don't know hey man before we sign off today we have to do something very important okay celebrate the moment that ringo Starr sat in with paul mccartney this past weekend I just know. 79 years old ringo and the two remaining beatles still giving their heart and soul to the world like that is just a reminder of all that's good in the world, don't you think? Yeah, it's been what five years since they they played together, right? Because they they played for um, they played for the uh, um, the Beatles, you know, Ed Sullivan, whatever it was, fiftieth yeah. reunion. I think that was four or five years ago, and then before that, um, oh, there was a great episode of of Nick Ruffini's Drummers Resource podcast, and I'll put a link to it where he interviewed Greg Bisonette who Mm -hmm. fantastic drummer and Greg has been playing, or I think he's still in, but certainly at the time of the interview, he's in the Ringo's all-star band and they brought as a surprise to Ringo, they brought McCartney out uh, Mm -hmm. on Ringo's birthday. And uh, so, yeah. So anyway, they, um, but yes, yeah, it's good that those guys like are still doing this together and, and reminding us what, what, uh, what magic comes from, Perfect music. Yeah, man. It, like I have problems with the word perfect, but man, if any, if any music <laughs> is perfect, it's the Beatles music. <laughs> like, like it might be okay to assign that word to, to what they did together. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And they, so. un- like, it's clear they understand the meaning of of them being on stage together without a doubt. Right. Like this isn't just like, Oh, it's my friend. You know, this guy I used to play in a band with or whatever. Like they get that it's bigger than the two of them. It's bigger than the four of them. Right. Like it's, it's it, like, it, it is a cultural tent pole. Uh, like, they treat it with the reverence that it deserves correct. with the, with the, with this self-effacing love and humor that the, that was the Beatles. I mean, it's right. right. It, it, that's why it takes you back. That's why anything you may know, no matter what age you are, if you've been exposed to the Beatles, you you get the idea that they they were the lads. They were this, you know, they were having a laugh, you know, at, at the whole ride yeah. while doing this incredible stuff. And, you know, you see those two together and you were just reminded how good music can be. I mean, like we talked about that movie yesterday. You are yeah. reminded how amazing those songs are. Those two human beings on stage just humbles you as to what music can do. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. It's freaking great. And then Joe Walsh sat in too, right? Mm-hmm. For, yep. for the end of the, the, for the end actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So drummers out there, if you, I'm sure you already know about the drummers resource podcast, but Nick Ruffini does uh, his interviews are killer. He's a great, great interviewer. And my guess is he's a great drummer, although I've never uh, had the pleasure of seeing him play. So I'll put a link to, to that one in the show notes too. So good stuff. Cool. All right, folks. Well, that's uh, that's what we got for today, right? Nothing else, Mr. Kent? Fun chat. A little heavy, but fun chat. It was a little heavy, but it's okay every now and then. Like, these are important things. It's good. Plus, we just got to vent sometimes. It's what we do. We got to vent. 
So put on some better clothes and always be performing. That's what I'm going to do on Friday night, man. Hedwig at midnight. I'm looking forward Go to get getting him. back in that uh, in that costume. Yeah.